And now stay tuned for X minus one on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, a story by Frederick Pohl, Tunnel Under the World. On the morning of June 15th, Guy Burkhart woke up screaming. Ah! It was more real than any dream he'd ever had in his life. He could still hear and feel that sharp metal-ripping explosion, that searing wave of heat. He sat up. Mary! 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 Mary, where are you? Guy, what's wrong? You're trembling. Where were you? In the kitchen cooking breakfast. What is it? Oh, oh, a dream, I guess. An explosion. Did you say an explosion? Yes. But that's the dream I had. What? I dreamed there was a big explosion and then something sort of hit me on the head. Holy smokes. Maybe there really was some sort of explosion, and it started us dreaming. Well, there'll be an explosion down at your office if you don't hurry and get to work. Coming in on the bus, Burkhart watched to see if there was any evidence of an explosion. There wasn't. If anything, the town looked better than ever. The only thing that seemed strange to him was the fact that none of the usual crowd was on the bus. He was a little relieved when he did see his old pal, Henry Swanson. Excuse me. Henry. You pardon me, sir, please. Henry, what's the matter with you? It's me, Guy Burkhart. Burkhart? Sorry, I I don't believe we've met. What? Henry, for Pete's sake, it's me. If you'll excuse me, this is my stop. Well, I'll be... How do you like that? Guy Burkhart got off in front of the gigantic Contro Chemical Building and took the elevator to the 98th floor where he had worked in the accounting department for 12 years. It wasn't until he was almost at his floor that he realized the speaker wasn't playing the usual commercials. Are you happy with your present home freezer? Of course not. Well, the answer to your problem is a feckle freezer. Feckle freezers are better freezers. Most wives would do anything for a feckle freezer. Are you happy with your present home freezer? Of course not. Good morning, Miss Orne. Good morning, Mr. Burkhart. Oh, new hairdo, I see. Well, yes. Do you like it? it? Makes a lot of difference in your appearance. Is uh, Mr. Barth in? Why, no, sir. He, uh had an appointment with Mr. Dorchin at the advertising agency. Today? But today is the 15th of June. He has to sign the quarterly statement. He said he wouldn't be in. That's mighty peculiar. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Miss Horn, what the devil is a feckle freezer? A feckle freezer? There's some new copy on the elevator commercial. Dorchin must have landed another account. (laughs) Feckle freezers. I really don't know, Mr. Burkhart. It's a funny day. Can't quite put my finger on it. There's something strange going on. He couldn't shake the thought out of his mind. It persisted all through the day and through dinner. He was still brooding as he and Mary got ready for bed. 
I guess I'll get a good night's sleep. Coming? I think I'll sit up and read for a while. All right, dear. Good night. Good night, dear. At exactly midnight, Guy Burkhart lapsed into a sudden, deep sleep. And the following morning, he woke up screaming. (laughs) Darling, what is it? What's wrong? Uh, uh, Oh, nothing. A bad dream, I guess. You gave me such a shock. I, I seem to be having a lot of nightmares lately. Really? Yes. The, the one I had yesterday. This was the same. A, a big explosion and then nothing. You had a dream yesterday? Of course I did. You had the same sort of dream. I? Oh, Guy, you're mistaken. I don't remember dreaming. Mary, you told me. Guy, you're mistaken. But, Mary. Maybe you dreamed I had a dream. Maybe you... Yes. I might have done that, I suppose. Everything did seem sort of strange yesterday. That's probably it. You'd better get dressed, dear. Today's the 15th, and that's when the quarterly statement... The 15th? Yes. Well, then, there must have been a dream. Because yesterday was the 15th. Guy Burkhart got up, dressed, ate breakfast, and took the usual bus to work. Once again, everything seemed even brighter and newer than usual. Once again, he was puzzled when he noticed none of the old crowd on the bus. Pardon me, please. Look, don't shove so. Oh, Henry, good morning. Good morning. Don't you recognize your neighbors? I don't believe we've met. Henry, it's me, Guy Burkhart. What's going on? I'm sure I don't know, sir. For God's sake, don't talk to me. What is it? Are you being followed or something? Don't you know? I was sure you remembered. Remembered what? I can't talk. This is my stop, sir. Will you please excuse me? Henry! Henry, for Pete's sake! As in yesterday's dream, Guy Burkhart got off at his stop and took the elevator to the 98th floor. The speaker in the elevator purred a new commercial this time. Marlin cigarettes. They're sanitized. Does your present cigarette make your throat feel raspy and unpleasant? Marlin cigarettes contain a miraculous new drug which actually gives you the sensation of smooth, creamy smoke. Marlin cigarettes. Marlin cigarettes. Marlin cigarettes. He walked down the marble corridor to his office. Good morning, Mr. Burkhart. Good morning, Miss Horn. Do you like my new hairdo? Why, yes, uh... Is Mr. Barth in? No, sir. He had an appointment, appointment with, with Mr. Dorchin, Dorchin at the agency. I know. You know? I guessed it anyway. And today's the 15th of June, and he won't be here to sign the quarterly statement. And I'm going nuts. Let me have a cigarette, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, try one of these. They're Marlin. I never heard of Marlins before today. What are we... A bunch of guinea pigs for Dorchin's new advertising accounts? Is something wrong, Mr. Burker? Wrong? Perish the thought, Miss Horn. Perish the thought. Hello? This is Swanson. Henry Swanson. What is it? Do you remember? Remember what? Just remember. Listen, Henry, let's stop playing games. Yesterday, either I was dreaming or... You snubbed me on the bus. Today, the same thing happens. You do remember, thank heavens. I thought so when I saw you, but I couldn't be sure. What is it you want? Listen, tomorrow morning, when I get off the bus, you get off with me. But be casual. They may be watching. Who may be watching? Swanson! Hello? You bus, Mr. Burkhart? Yes, sir. I'm still out of cigarettes. Would you buy me a pack of Kelvins? Wouldn't you rather have Marlin? I smoke Kelvins. But, Mr. Burkhart, Marlins have that soft, creamy smoke that's so soothing to your throat. <laughs> you really believe that stuff? Well, it's true. I, I wouldn't say this, Mr. Burkhart, except that, well, I've gotten to know you pretty well, and I, I've 
grown to admire you so much. I see. Would you mind, Mr. Burkhardt, if I told you that that for months now I've, I've wanted to, well, just comfort you. I know how troubled you've been. You've never mentioned your feelings, Miss Horn. April. My first name is April. That's a pretty name. You see, I do have your welfare at heart. That's why when I see you smoking Kelvins, and I know Marlins are so much better, won't you let me buy some of them for you? I suppose so. Why not? Uh, here, you bring me a carton. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Guy. I, uh... <clears throat> I'll be back. There was something wrong, something definitely peculiar about what was happening. The call from Henry Swanson, the strange behavior of this secretary, Miss Horn, these new products, the dream. Guy Burkhart went home that night feeling like a man in a nightmare. That you, dear? Yes, me. Have a good day. Fair. Oh, before you sit down, would you go down the cellar and put in a new fuse? The switch in the hall closet blew out, and I shut it off. Okay. Supper will be ready in a minute, so don't start fooling around with that old boat hull you've been building. I won't. Mary! Mary! What is it? Come down here. Hurry up! What is it? Uh, I'm not sure. I was looking for a fuse, and I thought maybe I'd drop one under the boat hull, so I scratched around. Look. Let me put the flashlight on it. Well? Look at the floor. What about the floor? It's supposed to be cement. Well? It's copper. There's a thin layer of cement, but underneath it's metal. Look here. Underneath the concrete. More metal. There. And here, on the wall. Metal. Metal under the floor, behind the walls, every place. Well, I don't really understand. Mary, I know this sounds crazy, but somebody, for reasons I can't begin to guess, has taken this house and replaced it with a clever imitation. God. I know it sounds insane, but take a look. That bracing on the beams, that isn't the bracing that was always there. Oh, you're imagining. I am not imagining. Mary, I'm going to look around for a little more. Well, your dinner will be ready. Save it for me. There are a couple of things I have to figure out. The following morning, Guy Burkhart woke up, screaming. He dragged himself into the kitchen where his wife Mary was preparing breakfast and discovered it was still June 15th. Mary, Mary, listen. Guy, what is it you're trembling? Mary, the dream. Dream? About the explosion. The same one we've been having. We? I didn't dream about any explosion. You did. Why are you covering up? Covering up? Guy, what's happened to you? It happened. It happened. What? Where's the morning paper? Where is it? Outside the door, I guess. <laughs> June 15th. Well, you'd better hurry. Today's the day Mr. Barth fills out the quarterly tax return. No, it isn't. What? He won't be there. He'll be at a meeting with the head of the advertising agency. Mr. Dorchin? He'll be there. And Miss Horn will have a new hairdo. And the elevator will be selling some new product. And Swanson... What about Swanson? Swanson. He's... I wonder... I wonder if it's going to be the same today or, or whether... Guy, what in the world are you talking about? <sighs> Nothing. Where's my coat? You haven't had breakfast. I don't want to miss my bus. I'll see you tonight. Guy Burkhart got on his bus. There were the same unfamiliar faces, the same unusually new-looking buildings, the same unusually bright sunshine, and Henry Swanson, pale and furtive. Oh, excuse me, sir. You're quite all right. Do you remember the phone call? Yes. Oh, thank heaven. Get off at the next corner and follow me. Where are you going? There's an excavation for a building about a block down. But make sure you aren't followed. I'll go first. Um, 
Burkhart. Burkhart, here behind the fence. Uh, now, Henry, what's this all about? Just a minute. I want to make sure you weren't followed. Followed by whom? By them, of course. And just who are they? I'm not sure. At first, I thought perhaps they were Russians. Now, I... now I'm beginning to think they're Martians. No humans could have accomplished what they've accomplished. Look, start from the beginning, Henry. What's going on? Burkhardt, peculiar things have been happening to you, right? Yes. A lot of your friends are missing. Your house seems changed. Yeah, there's something stranger than that. The date today is June 15th. Yet I could swear that yesterday was June 15th and the day before that. Yes, you've got it. It's always June 15th. And you and I are the only ones who know it. But why? How? I'm not sure. I, I think it's some sort of mass hypnosis or something. Why didn't it work for us? Um, my wife Mary doesn't remember things. Somehow when it happened, they missed us. We were protected from the full force of the, the rays or whatever they use. Burkhardt, where were you on the night of the 14th, about midnight? That was Sunday night. Yes. I was down in the cellar, under that boat I'm building. And I was in my dark room developing some pictures. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Russians, Martians. <laughs> what makes you think so? I've seen them. Where? At the end of the tunnel. What tunnel? The one that they built under Tyler Town. A tunnel under Tyler Town? Yes, that's right. It's made out of copper or some alloy. Wait a minute. I found a copper layer under my cellar floor last yeah, night. Yes, so did I. That's how I discovered it. I found a way to get in, too. It's at the bottom of this excavation. Holy mackerel. Why don't we tell the police? Because we can't trust them. Even the police may be Martians in disguise. You're being melodramatic. Am I? You just come with me. Where? Into the tunnel. I'll show you. Henry Swanson led Guy Burkhardt to a small hole in the side of the excavation. There he removed a cut-out piece of metallic substance, and they crawled into a dimly lighted tunnel. They walked for what seemed like two miles, until Swanson held his finger to his lips. We've got to be quiet now. Henry, this is fantastic. We've got a tunnel right under the whole town. Oh, Burkhardt, you haven't seen anything yet. There's a room a little further down. We'll be able to look through a glass in the door. Is it safe? It's perfectly safe. Unless one of them comes along. Now, come on. Here. Look through this glass. Now, just so I know I'm not completely insane, tell me what you see. Good Lord! Well? A tremendous panel! Dozens of telescreens. And in front of each, a servo robot. They, they seem to be computing something. Yes. I've watched them. They're evaluating data from the screens. Evaluating? Why not? Each of them has a part of a human mind. Remember that. It's against the law to transfer an evaluating circuit from a human brain to a robot. Burkhardt, whoever is conducting this monstrous experiment is operating far outside the law. Have you gotten a chance to look at the data on those screens? No. No, I, I've been afraid to go in. There might be a warning circuit somewhere. If we knew what those robots were working on, we could go to the authorities. Well, I'll risk it if you will. It's worth a chance. We're lost anyway. Okay. Open the door. So far, so good. Come on. Let's take a look at that data. Yes, but don't interfere with the robots. Don't worry. Let's look at the screen. Listen to this. Tests in the 47K12 group with Marlin cigarettes pulled 80% using the soft feminine approach. Indications are that an extension of this approach would sell at least 70% nationwide. On the Feckle freezers, the direct elevator pitch pulled only 10%. 
this should be abandoned and a new series of high persuasion elements introduced. Henry, do you know what this means? I haven't the faintest idea. I don't blame you. It's crazy, but it fits the facts when I think about it. Do you know who's behind this? Martians. Not Martians, Henry. Advertising men. What? I don't know who they are or how they've done it, but somehow they've taken Tyler Town over. They've got you and me and 30,000 others right under the thumbs. Hypnosis. Hypnosis drugs. Maybe some kind of ray or something. However they do it, what happens is that they let us live through a single day. During that day, they pour all kinds of suggestions and propaganda into us. At the end of the day, they evaluate the results, see how we've reacted. Then at midnight, they wash the day out of our minds. And the next morning, we start the same day over again with different stimuli. No, I, I can't believe it. I know it sounds ridiculous, but think of it. They can run the perfect test, and on a whole community. Do you know what that means? Suppose one man learned how to influence people 100%. In a year, he could sell us anything from freezers to political candidates. Oh, now, wait a minute. We're Carl. guinea pigs, Henry. This whole community is one big test tube for propaganda research. What do we do? Somehow, we get out of this town and get to the FBI. Do you think we can? Yeah, it's worth a try. Come on. Wait. What is it? Look. Look. There's somebody coming down the tunnel. We've got to hide. Quick, behind the circuit box. Shh. Good Lord. It's Dorchin, the head of the agency that does our advertising. Quiet. All right, Burkhardt, come out. We know you're in this room. Miss Horn has informed us that you remember. I must warn you, it's useless to buck us. Come out peacefully and let our maintenance crew adjust you properly so you don't remember from one experiment to the next. It'll be quite painless. If you don't come out peacefully, we'll have to get you. Henry, take this wrench. When I give the word, jump him. He may be armed. We've nothing to lose. Very well. I'm coming after you. Now! Burkhardt. Burkhardt, I've killed him. Wait. i get his coat unbuttoned. Maybe his heart is still beating. Henry. What is it? What's wrong? Look. Underneath his coat. Oh, heaven help us. It's a robot. A humanoid robot. Designed to look like Dorchin. Come on, let's get out of here. Wait! What's that? A loudspeaker. I told you it was useless, gentlemen. Who are you? Mr. Dorchin, naturally. The real Mr. Dorchin. What are you trying to do to us? Merely trying to prevent you from damaging my experiment, gentlemen. You can't get away with this, Dorchin. Sooner or later, somebody, the FBI or somebody, is going to get wind of this madness. Oh, now, really, Burkhart, you're quite naive. Now, why don't you be reasonable and let the maintenance crew adjust you? If I refuse, I suppose you'll kill me. That would be quite impossible. Oh? You see, Burkhart, you're already dead. Dead? You're shocked. It's quite true. You and everyone else in this town were killed by premature atomic blast at the Control Chemical Plant. The blast occurred at 7 a.m. on June 15th. That's the last thing imprinted on your minds. That's why you wake up screaming each morning. It isn't true. Oh, but it is. What I and my associates did was take the brain circuits from your dead bodies. We stored them in electrochemical batteries until we had a chance to rebuild the cities and begin our tests. Do you think I believe a, a fantastic tale like that? I imagine you find it incredible. Of course, we didn't rebuild everything exactly. After all, it only has to last for a single day. June 15th. At midnight, we turn off the power and wash out the memory of the day. You and your friend Swanson, unfortunately, have defective circuits. You remember. 
Burkhardt, it's no use. We're trapped. Please give up. Not me. Yes, but what can we do? We can make a run for it down the tunnel. Come on. It's useless, Burkhardt. Keep going. It's useless. 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 Break out. Break out. It's no use. You go ahead. I'm finished. Look, we're almost the end of the tunnel. I can see a door. Here, I'll help you. I can. Just a little further. No. No. Uh, now, here. Here, this door is open. It opens. Oh, no. Uh, I don't believe it. I can't run anymore. Come on. So long, so you go ahead. Oh. I'm finished. Look, we're almost the end of the tunnel. There was I can see a door. Here, I'll help you. I can. Just a little the further. The ledge dropped away into a chasm so deep they could not see the bottom. Okay. The stars are... Beyond was only a glare so bright that their eyes could not stand to look into it. And yet, just beyond the limit of their vision, something towered. Something so huge it was almost inconceivable. Something... Burkhardt. Yeah. Yes? This is Dorchen. Now do you understand why it's useless? The great looming figure moved closer. It seemed to take shape now, and yet it was so gigantic as to be unbelievable. It came closer. The glare was partially blocked, and then Guy Burkhart knew that the towering shape was none other than Dorchen himself. You see how I did it, Burkhart? I took your brain circuits and had them reduced so they could be transferred to tiny humanoid mannequins. That's what you are, Burkhart, a tiny miniature of yourself. And this city, this whole experiment I'm conducting, is built on a tabletop. It was the morning of June 15th, and Guy Burkhart woke up screaming. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Man of Distinction by Michael Shara. Being completely unique in this world is not only a mathematical impossibility, it is also a matter of pride. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Tunnel Under the World, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frederick Pohl and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Norman Rose, Dean Alnquist, Amy Siddell, Elaine Rost, Bob Hastings, Ken Rapif, and Larry Haynes. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Scott Buckley and is an NBC Radio Network production. Music of Russ Morgan live on Bandstand weekday mornings on NBC Radio. 